or science for police. And uh, because some of the procedures that we normally go through uh, were not the ones that were used for advertising this, some of you probably don't know anything about science for peace, and let me tell you. Uh, science for peace has existed as a U of T uh, organization uh, for 35 or 34 years, something like that. Uh, it uh, consists largely of academics primarily of academics who are interested in uh, global issues and who hold uh, uh, events, so for example, we probably hold about 60 events a year, such as this, uh, uh, once a week throughout the academic term. And yes, we're good. And just waiting for one more. Uh, one Especially thank you and the, the organization that you have, Science for Peace, for uh, making this possible uh, in this wonderful venue. And it um, uh, looks like we are going to have full house. And uh, that, that's ter great because we have an absolutely uh, <coughs> terrific uh, international speaker who will be introduced uh, momentarily. <clears throat> so, uh, good morning. as. Uh, Dr. Spencer said, I'm John Valentinus, but those of you who uh, are meeting me for the first time, so I, I, I greet you friends, colleagues, students, and ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, welcome you to the University of Toronto. I used to work here. I'm a, uh, actually a, a retired prof from this venerable institution. I retired about 15 years ago, and uh, about three years ago, however, I, I reinvented myself as a passionate advocate for the protection of human and environment and health from unnecessary uh, man-made poisons and contraptions. Uh, unnecessary because uh, farming was uh, a great uh, human invention for centuries, millennia. But uh, anyway, so I, that's not what I'm going to talk about. But uh, I, I want to acknowledge, again, the, uh, the support and sponsorship of Science for Peace. And uh, uh, <clears throat> before going on, I, I also thank uh, the, the, uh, uh, the other supporters, uh, uh, who, who are some of whom are here, and, and uh, that's how it came together. But I particularly want to acknowledge my um, uh, friend and um, brilliant co-worker that's uh, <coughs> Melody Bibble, who is a holistic nutritionist. And if it wasn't for Mem uh, uh, Melody, uh, Melody, please stand up for a second. Uh, <coughs> most of you know <coughs> For myself, I, I belong to the old school of, of uh, computing, <laughs> which, but anyway, it's nice to have uh, friends like Melody. But, in order to do justice to, uh, to introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to call on a, a well-known, um, perhaps not, not to all of you, but uh, generally well-known in Canada, uh, uh, Julie Danilo, uh, who is uh, this beautiful lady staying over there. Julie is a uh, Canadian nutritionist, author of a best-seller book, uh, Meals That Heal, Inflama uh, Heal Information. Uh, she's, she appeared on numerous TV and radio shows, among them the Dr. Oz Show, and is a resident expert on the Marilyn Dennis Show. She hosts the Healthy Gourmet on Upper Winfrey Network. And her new book, which I think will be a bestseller also, is just out, and it's Slimming Meals That Heal. I think that, that the, the title sort of says it all. So, uh, and she explores uh, in this book why information causes weight gain, which um, some of us are familiar with, myself included, and how an anti-inflammatory superfoods shed pounds without dieting. I mean, I, I, I'm going to buy that book, Julie. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, Julie, the floor is yours. Thank you. How do you introduce a hero? It's certainly been uh, a big week, and uh, I, I know that there are so many environmentalists, there's so many nutritionists, and concerned parents, and concerned citizens out there 
who are, are here because we absolutely appreciate and are deeply grateful for your sacrifice and deeply grateful for all the work that you do that, that is risky and time consuming and just know how grateful we are. So I just want to just start with an incredible moment of gratitude for your work. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to uh, just beam with how much this lady has accomplished. And this is a very brief bio. So Dr. Stephanie Seneff is a senior research scientist at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She has a Bachelor of Science degree from MIT in Biology and a PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. She's published over 200 peer-reviewed papers in scientific journals and conference proceedings. Her recent interests have focused on the role of toxic chemicals and micronutrient deficiencies, concentrating on the relationship between nutrition and health, with a special emphasis on the pervasive herbicide Roundup and the mineral sulfur. And she's published over two dozen papers in various medical and health journals on topics such as Alzheimer's, autism, cardiovascular disease, and the impact of nutritional deficiencies and environmental toxins on human health. She's made appearances at international conferences, spending countless hours at public lectures, various broadcast media around the world on subjects involving cholesterol and statin drugs, gripping information that I highly recommend you check out. The healing of, of the microbiome, the importance of that work, and that's very pioneering. You were there way before it's popular as it is right now. Mental health issues and the role of toxic substances in vaccines. And her work has caught the attention of documentarians, and it's exciting to see her interviewed in the controversial film Vaxxed, if you have a, a chance to get to see that. Dr. Seneth is highly sought after on these complex relationships, explaining the connection between human health and toxic substances. These toxins enter our body through the food chain and may cause serious health problems. And that's why this topic is so vital to every single human being. I believe that it's most important for health officials, policymakers, and regulators. And would you agree that we really have to find responsible journalists in the mainstream media that will begin to pay attention to these issues now so that the general, general public can learn the truth. So her special lecture today, GMOs and glyphosate, real threats to human and environmental health, is not only timely, but it's vitally important to everyone. So I want you to put your hands together once again. Let's get a huge amount of energy. start with a quote, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And I certainly feel that way right now about myself. The knowledge that I've acquired about glyphosate, I need to spread it to the world and you guys can help me do that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. No? Okay, I'll try to. All right, so here's an outline. I have a lot of um, material to cover and some of it will be just kind of brief overview so that you'll have to um, pay close attention or you'll miss things. I'm going to start with a general overview of the situation with uh, GMOs and glyphosate, and I'm going to talk about evidence of toxicity, and then I'm going to get into a specific topic about glyphosate that I am, uh, have re recently become aware of and that I'm very, very worried about, which is the concept that glyphosate can insinuate itself into proteins during synthesis. If this is true, it has huge consequences, and those consequences easily explain all the correlations we're seeing with multiple modern diseases like Alzheimer's and autism. So I'm quite excited about this, and Anthony Sampson and I have a new paper that is uh, in, ready for proof. So we're waiting for proof. We're going to get a paper out on this topic, and when that comes out, you can read it in gory detail. There's a lot of information in that paper. Um, so in that concept of glyphosate and, and proteins, I'm going to talk about sugar beets, glyphosate, multiple sclerosis, and mad cow disease. Very, very interesting story emerging there. Second topic, collagen, arthritis, and vaccines. Uh, neurological diseases, uh, diabetes, obesity, and adrenaline sufficiency, and then finally, how to safeguard yourself and your family. So a lot of material, we'll try to move quickly along. 
Um, this is the new childhood in America. Kids are sick in, in our country, and I don't know, it's probably similar in Canada. Uh, one in three is overweight, uh, one in six has learning disabilities, one in nine has asthma, we've got ADHD, food, lots and lots of food allergies, seizures, uh, and then the really scary thing to me is the autism, one in 54 males, one in 88 uh, children, that is updated to one in 68 more recently, and half the children have either a chronic illness or they're overweight. So we are in trouble in America and we need to understand why. Uh, Roundup, so what is glyphosate? How many have heard of the word glyphosate here? That's really good news. <laughs> the word is getting out because I think it's a pretty, it was a pretty obscure word a few years back. That's Roundup, you can kill the dandelions in your yard or you can spray Roundup poison all over your crop, food crops, which is what they do with the GMO Roundup ready crops. So we have corn, soy, canola, sugar beets, cotton, tobacco, and alfalfa have all been engineered to resist this chemical, otherwise it kills all plants. So something that kills all plants is not likely to be non-toxic to humans, although Monsanto claims that it is. Um, and they also spray it on, on other crops right before the harvest as a desiccant, and those crops are bound to have end up with lots of glyphosate in the food that's derived from them. And that includes wheat and sugar beets and oats, so some very basic foods there as well. Non-GMO, but still sprayed with glyphosate. So this is uh, the plot that really scares me. This, the blue boxes are the autism rates in the United States in first grade, according to the IDEA, which gives you uh, extra help for the children that are diagnosed with autism. Over time, at the left is 19, 1995 is where it first starts in here, and it goes off to 2011 on the right. Um, the, the, the red is the glyphosate usage on corn and soy crops over the previous four years. So that's like from the age of two to the age of six in that child's life. And uh, the correlation is incredibly perfect, 0 0.997, 1.0 is the best you can be of these two curves. They basically coincide with a huge, uh, hugely significant result. Um, so why is this uh, increase in glyphosate? Well, the problem is the Roundup Ready crops. And you can see they were first introduced in 1996. There were just a you know, low percentage of the, of the crops. This is for soy, cotton, corn, uh, soy, cotton, and corn. This middle one is an average of, uh, is a combination of corn and soy, the blue one. Um, and the yellow is the soy. Um, and you can see that by the end, 2012, this is a very rapid ad uh, adoption of these crops from 1996 to 2012. By 2012, you have 90% of all of these crops are GMO engineered to be, to be um, Roundup Ready. And what's happened is, is Roundup Ready weeds have appeared among these Roundup Ready crops, weeds that resist glyphosate. So they've had to use more and more every year to fight those weeds. And, and now they're facing some serious problems of what to do next because the glyphosate isn't working anymore. Uh, this, I was really glad to see this in Newsweek uh, recently, February 2nd of this year, um, because it's unusual to see these kinds of things in mainstream journals. Uh, like I said, usage has increased 50-fold since 1996 um, when those GMO crops were first introduced. Today, 50 times more glyphosate is allowed on the corn grain compared to 1996. Half the American farmers' fields have weeds that are resistant. And now they're saying, oh, well, we've got to add some more resistance. Let's just add another chemical here. Let's try 2,4-D, which is a, uh, a, a component of Agent Orange in Vietnam. We'll just add that. We'll just put that in as well because that can kill the weeds that are resistant to glyphosate. So now we have Endless Duo, which has been approved in the United States, along with these dual resistant crops. Um, so here's some statistics on glyphosate residues and their effects in studies. Uh, 0.1 part per billion, that's a very tiny amount. Exposure, alter the gene function of over 4,000 genes in the livers and kidneys of rats. Also 0.1 uh, resulted in severe organ damage in rats. And that's the level that's permitted in the water in Europe, in the European top water. Uh, 10 parts per billion show toxic effects on the livers of fish. 700 parts per billion is what the US allows in its water. And I looked up Canada, that's 280 parts per billion. So you're better than the US, but you're much worse than Europe. And 11,900 parts per billion is what was found in genetically modified soybeans. So there's where we sit. And so Zan Monica is the hero of my work. She's from Moms Across America. She founded Moms Across America, and she's been measuring glyphosate and various things. And she found levels in human breast milk from Americans who were being relatively conscientious.